Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying Sasquatch encounters. Now, before I start, I want to let you know that on this channel, I like to share encounters that are more of a slow boil, that tend to create an atmosphere and a mood. If you're a fan of encounters like this, be sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on the notifications. I post new videos every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, and if you have your notifications on, you'll be the first to know when those videos go live. All right, let's get right into it. We have been hiking for several days following the snake, as we call it, when we found ourselves situated on an embankment, perhaps several hundred feet in height, overlooking the snake and the Tetons in the distance. From our position atop this hillside, we had a panoramic view of the opposing bank of the river, which extended as far as the eye could see in virtually any direction. Specifically, the bank that was directly opposite to us had very little, if any, tree cover. The cover that was visible grew gradually denser the further from the river it was. Several members of our group, almost at the same moment in time, began to point out several dark colored animals moving through the trees on the other side. From our perspective, without the aid of any devices, these animals appeared as small black specks in the distance. But that would soon change. Each of the members of our group had their own pair of binoculars, which we now had taken out. As we all had our binoculars fixed on what previously had been three dark specks walking along in the trees, the consensus was resounding. What we were seeing was three Bigfoot walking along the snake, one of them being quite a bit larger than the other two, and all of them walking in single file. From this distance, even with the aid of our binoculars, there was virtually no detail to be seen, other than recognizing their unusual gait and arm swing. Their arms swing in a very robotic fashion, as though they are two stiff appendages hanging from their sides, which are hinged at the shoulder. The three of them were all walking in what appeared to be a forward tilt, which is most certainly different than that of a human being. Their steps were uniform and very deliberate, showing no variation the entire time that we were watching. We had eyes on them for about half an hour before they were out of view within the trees. About ten minutes later, they then reappeared in a clearing further up the river, but by this time they were at least a mile away from our position. Once again, they appeared as specks, even with the aid of our binoculars. As you would imagine, there was quite a conversation going on between us as to what we collectively had just seen. Many in the group didn't believe they existed. Speaking for myself, I believed, but with certain reservations. This day had changed all of that for everyone. We knew exactly what we were looking at, and that beyond the shadow of a doubt. These were in no way three hikers wearing black. They had brown fur covering that was visible from head to toe. They were carrying no supplies, and they were wearing no footwear. All of these things being a recipe for death in this area for a human. And yet, there they were, before our eyes. 
On to the next story. My wife and I moved to Pendleton, Oregon from Great Falls, Montana to help her aging parents and manage their ranch property. We have enjoyed many excursions to explore Oregon's exciting past. One most memorable trip was when in our travel trailer staying at a campground in Baker City, our travels took us to gold mines and to valleys that had been totally dug up by huge gold dredges and the large gold mining operation with their massive buildings standing guard all throughout these mountains. We spent time at the county offices in Baker City and met by chance an old pioneer who had been a gold miner for many years. He told us that the first county seat was the town of Auburn. We spent a very enjoyable hour over lunch while our new friend regaled us with stories of the early times in this area. Mr. Henry, our new friend, gave us directions to the area where the town of Auburn sat. Early the next morning, we made our way to what at one time was a city of six to eight thousand miners, although there is absolutely no trace of it ever having had any occupants. We truly had a tough time finding it. Parking at the edge of a dirt road that appeared to have little use, we made our way into a rocky valley that was beneath a couple of large man-made ponds that had been a major source of water for sluicing the grounds in this vast valley. We got there after some recent spring rains, so there were large places that had newly been eroded from the rains, and as we walked the area that looked like a huge gravel pit, we found some broken pieces of Chinese opium pipes and shards of porcelain, but nothing of value. The history of this typical boom town was that this entire city had been composed of hastily built buildings, gambling dens, miner supply stores, and saloons scattered all around the area. The miners lived in anything from shacks to lean-tos to tents. Later, after the gold production was waning, a wildfire burned the entire city to the ground. Next, as so often happened back then, the white miners moved on and the Chinese moved in. Our new friend, Mr. Henry, had informed us that everyone thought this area had been cursed because the next disaster that ultimately ended the town of Auburn's existence was a tremendous flood. As the fire had destroyed all the trees, there was nothing to stabilize the soil, and everything was utterly devastated, and even the super patient and determined Chinese miners up and left. The only thing that survived in this area was a partial corral and building that may have belonged to a hostler. On the corner post was nailed an extremely rusted and large horseshoe. It was nailed open and up, so according to superstition, the luck was still in it. It was solidly held in place by ancient nails. We could not resist, and even though we weren't supposed to, this lucky horseshoe now had a nice home with us. We firmly believed it saved us from harm just about an hour later. We stopped for lunch at what had been a wagon road between two ramps that had been used for driving a large freight wagon in loading it from the ramps. We were admiring the ingenuity of these miners when a rock, about football-sized, suddenly smashed into our thermos. With coffee and sandwiches flying in all directions, we instinctively ducked and circled to look for the cause, but we were alone. We were in a sort of bowl, 
and it was over 200 feet to the nearest cliff. Knowing it was impossible for this to have been an accident, we took the hint, grabbed our broken equipment and knapsack, and headed back towards where we came in. I yelled a couple of times more to let whoever did it know that I was mad than anything else, but we were both trying to figure out if it was kids with a catapult or what. Suddenly, behind us, a shaggy form appeared at the place where we had picnicked, and it was shaking and stomping its feet and making sounds like loud, hoarse coughing and snorting. Then it must have thought we weren't leaving fast enough because it lobbed another rock at us, and I swear we were over 200 feet away. And this rock, the size of a salad bowl, flew over our heads and was close enough to make both of us duck. The animal was covered with long brown shaggy fur, and when it appeared first at the spot we had been eating, it was in the trench between the two ramps, and it was taller than the top of the ramps, which I'm sure means it was over seven feet tall. I almost threw the horseshoe away in my haste to quickly grab our stuff, but my wife reminded me that we were not hurt, so we agreed that it was really lucky. We stopped in at a small grocery store in Baker, and the friendly storekeeper listened to our story with a nod and knowing grin. And he just said, I see he's still with us. Thought he'd moved on, but that critter has been there for years. Then he gave us our change and simply went back to his work like it was no surprise. Since that happened, we have heard similar instances in eastern Oregon from acquaintances, and it was an experience we have told over and over every time someone inquires about our old rusted horseshoe. On to the next story. Far below the summit of the mountains, on a steep hill, a massive elk lifts its tremendously large rack as its eyes home in on a familiar and accepted forest dweller, but due to its resemblance to humans, suspicious and usually avoided Sasquatch. The eight-foot-tall creature passes by with hardly more than a glance at the 1,500-pound statuesque sentry of the forest and ambles its way down the narrow gully toward the wide pond below. The giant walks, stooped over, more like a gorilla in a zoo, but it does not use its knuckles as assists in its travels. The long arms occasionally flex outward, but seemingly more for balance, only occasionally reaching out to a branch or tree for an assist. The winter has been long and harsh, and a meal of marsh grass and lilies is on today's menu. Perhaps a handful of the succulent water chestnuts will add to its pleasurable repost. Far above this scene, a bald eagle soars soundlessly over it all, and its shadow passes over a crouching mountain lion as its eyes are affixed on the newly arrived mule deer fawn as she grazes on the new grass. Into this serene wilderness, thanks to modern transportation, enters man, noisy, constantly chattering, and disruptive to the peaceful atmosphere of one of the last truly pristine areas in the state of Oregon. This particular couple has recently arrived at the Lake of the Woods campground where they had long before made reservations. Introducing to this scene Darren and Denise W. We'll let Darren take it from here as it is their story. I'm taking an extended leave from my career as a long-haul trucker. I have been to all 48 contiguous states, 
Now that I have some time off, Denise and I are exploring places that we both traveled past, as the company allowed for her to ride along on many of my long-haul trips. We had admired Oregon's beauty from a distance, and now we pulled into the space we had long in advance reserved for the summer Lake of the Woods campground. The camp host, Roger and Linda, make us feel welcome, and after we parked our fifth wheel and trailer, they helped us make our area into a comfortable space like our own backyard. After a tour of the beautifully maintained campground and leisurely relaxing in our outdoor lounge, we slept like never before. After breakfast the next morning, we packed a lunch and canteens and set out to check out our new summer home. We were wearing our brand new but terribly stiff hiking boots, lesson learned, and we followed the well-traveled lakeside trail. A myriad of paths crisscrossed throughout the areas surrounding the lake and we picked one that angled very slightly upward. And we could see above us that it appeared to switch back and forth as it seesawed up the lightly forested slope. The going was easy, and few people were out from what we could see was our higher vantage point when we met another couple coming down. Before we could even get out a hello, the man blurted out, we saw a Bigfoot. I met Denise's gaze and I could tell she also figured it to be a gag. The lady, however, joined in and after introductions were quickly made, they apologized for the wild greeting and began to calm down enough to explain further. The couple were also guests at the campground and had retired several years before. This was their second stay at the spot, and it turned out they were only three spaces away from our area. We explained that our rather standoffish attitude was because we automatically assumed it to be a joke people played on newbies. We had, of course, heard of Bigfoot, but had never given much thought to it, figuring it was more likely a hoax that was perpetuated by tourist bureaus and summer rental agencies and campgrounds. We reasoned that Roger and Linda had not wished to frighten anyone about the Sasquatch in case the people would think they were lying, and since anyone's chance of actually seeing this creature was evidently quite rare. Well, anyway, we enjoyed meeting Walt and Martha and visited often over our stay. After hearing their story, we thought it would be a good chance to see for ourselves, so with their directions, we headed up the trail. After about another six switchbacks, the trail turned left and began to wrap around the mountain. By now, we were high enough to see the beautiful scenery from a wide panorama. We could identify Oregon's Mount McLaughlin, even though there was a blue haze that covered the entire picture. As we walked further on the trail, it dipped down, and instead of a wide ridge, we dropped gradually into a sort of large bowl. As we descended, our scenic view rapidly disappeared, and we soon found ourselves in this grassy meadow the bottom of which was surrounded by both deciduous and very large pine trees. Once we reached the bottom of the slope, the trail stretched out through the waist-high grass, and there were many trails branching off in all directions. After another fifty yards, the trail once again began to descend slightly, and it was then that we saw the smallest lake where Walt and Martha said they saw the Bigfoot. We began walking more slowly in anticipation, and Denise pulled her camera out of her vest pocket to be prepared. The trail had now steepened enough that Dennis put the camera back in her pocket, and both of us were very slowly descending the now treacherous slope. 
having taken a single one of those collapsible aluminum hiking poles for each of us, our free hands seem to be constantly acting as balance weights to keep us from falling and slipping on the now very gravelly slope. Walt and Martha had not told us anything but that it was steep. They should have said dangerous, but maybe their experience was far advanced from that of us flatlanders. Finally, the trail turned off at a sharp angle and leveled out. We were now in a flat area, like the size of a soccer field, and the grasses were waist high. We could hear the crickets and the sound so familiar from my childhood, a bullfrog, the unmistakable scent of a swampy area added to the certainty that the water was nearby when the trail turned sharply, and there it was. An almost picture-perfect small lake covered for the most part with lily pads floating on the blue-black water, moving silently in the breeze and the small waves barely rippling the surface. And the small waves barely rippling the surface. Suddenly, we were startled by the splash of a smallish brown creature plunging into the dark water. It could have been an otter, muskrat, or perhaps even a beaver. Whatever it was, it caused us both to react in the most ruinous manner. Denise let out a semi-scream and shouted, Look! Well, our reactions triggered another reaction which we didn't want at all. Having stepped down the additional couple of feet to the water's edge, the surrounding grasses were now slightly above our eye level. That was when we heard the loud splashing and thrashing through the grasses to our right. We had startled some animal with our outburst. We quickly ran up to the path, and as we turned to where the sound was diminishing, we saw a large, ape-like creature retreating through the tall grasses. Within seconds, it had gained the heavily forested area, and then all was silent. We reasoned that we hadn't seen the Sasquatch when we arrived because it most likely had been fishing in the other end of the lake. Kicking ourselves for not having the precaution to always leave one to watch while the other ones explore, we then realized that the camera was back in Denise's pocket, so we wouldn't have had a photo regardless. Before we retraced our way back to camp, we searched the other side of the pond, and we did find one large depression on the edge of the dirt where it bordered the water and it seemed almost double to my size 11 boot, but it may have been smaller as it had filled with water almost to the top of the depression. We also found a large bullfrog that was still twitching slightly, but dead. I guess we ruined Bigfoot's lunch. I hope you enjoyed those stories, and if you did, be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell. I post new videos every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, and if you have your notifications on, you'll be the first to know when those go live. Again, thank you so much for watching the video, and until next time, bye!